good evening let's try again good evening welcome to the young scientist round table my name is vinod padde and i am welcoming you here on behalf of the volunteers who put together this program we have a speaker from university of wisconsin at madison dr kulsinski grew up in lacrosse wisconsin he received bs in chemical engineering in 1961 in nuclear engineering a phd in nuclear engineering in 1965 both from the university of wisconsin at madison today is the first session of our 27th year of young scientists round table thank you thank you the the point i want to emphasize is that over this 26 years we have had over 250 speakers who have come here and talked at a young scientist round table among among all the speakers dr kulsinski has a unique distinction he was a chemical engineering student at the university of wisconsin but also had a sports scholarship he played at the 1960 rose bowl as a right guard and a linebacker he proved sports and science are not mutually exclusive you can be both an athlete and a phenomenal scientist that's the point i wanted to talk about uh, dr kulsinski joined the nuclear energy program at the university of wisconsin in 1971 where he currently is the granger professor of nuclear engineering emeritus and the director of fusion technology institute just to, to name some of his recognitions in 1978 he became fellow in the american nuclear society in 1993 he received he was elected to the national academy of engineering in 1993 awarded nasa public service medal in 2005 to 2009 he worked he served on nasa advisory council 2008 he helped department of commerce and on emerging technology and research and and in 2010 he received second time the medal from nasa he was awarded nasa exceptional public service medal over 40 years of his career he has worked on various projects related to the effects of radiation on metals energy from moon neutron sources the title for this talk this evening is as you see here the red rover project detection of clandestine materials landmines and ieds dr kulsinski thank you vinod uh boy now i can't see the audience uh having the lights uh, shining on here but thank you for coming out tonight this was a a, a bad weather night and I, i my hats off to all of you who uh, made it and i see a lot of uh, looks like parents or or grandparents and and children and uh, that's terrific i'm glad to, glad to see that well uh, i'm going to uh, try to describe one of the projects that we are working on at the university of wisconsin uh, this is a rather recent a uh, project that we're working on uh it's only in the last few years uh prior to that we had about 40 i was working about 40 years on thermonuclear uh, fusion reactors to make electricity and this is really a spin-off from that technology of uh, of course if you're trying to make electricity you've got to make more energy than you put into it obviously it doesn't pay In this case, we're not worried about what we call the Q value, the energy out divided by the energy in. That can be very low if the product is worthwhile, either economically or from a humanitarian standpoint. And that's what this this project is more from a humanitarian area than it is from an economic area. So, while my background is in the in the economic uh production of energy uh, this is this is a, a relatively new area for us even though we have been working uh, uh in in the various uh projects this this way so i'm going to step out let's see you probably can't hear me though if i step out so um uh let's see am i blocking the screen for you okay 
Yeah, I, you are, I am blocking it for you. Okay, well, let's see how we're gonna do that. Oops, can't do it that way, we gotta do it this way. Okay, so what am I gonna cover today? How did we get into this work? Well, what prompted us and what motivated us to, to start this? And this is important, especially for you young folks, because as you're looking forward on your careers, you never know what is going to influence you to go one way or another. So this is just one example of the kinds of things that can happen that you don't plan on. I'll give you a, a very brief overview of the concept. Obviously, we've been working on this for years. Uh, I can't give you all the details uh, in uh, 30, 30 minutes or so that I'm gonna be talking. Uh, we'll talk about landmine and IED detection. How many people know what an IED is? Can you raise your hand? Okay, so about half of the audience, huh? Okay, that's an improvised explosive device, and I'll be talking about those. Uh, they're a little different than landmines because they're generally bigger uh, and have a different purpose, more military, and uh, uh, they're, the, it's, a, it's a different uh, uh, technology. And then I'll talk about other uh, potential applications. So what are we trying to avoid? We came at this particular project from a humanitarian standpoint. As you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, people, uh, uh, civilians that are being hurt by landmines around the world, uh, and particularly children, and they're losing limbs, uh, arms, legs, and, and sometimes even worse. Uh, so that was one of the things that motivated us to try to find a way to avoid these particular issues. We also want to avoid this, and that is from a, more from a military standpoint, IEDs, which are generally bigger and have a, a, an effect on a military operation. This one you see, uh, that explosive was fairly substantial and tipped over a truck and, and probably some casualties uh, on that. So first of all, it's humanitarian, but it's also from a standpoint of uh, protecting lives, especially uh, from our uh, first responders and, and military folks. So what's the objective of this project? Well, first of all, it's to rapidly detect, and that word rapidly has to be uh, emphasized because we, knew how to we know how to detect landmines, except that it's, it's uh, very laborious and uh, it's usually based on some of the old concepts for landmines where they have uh, metallic casings and you detect the landmines with magnetometers. Unfortunately, during the Balkans and maybe even before that, the Italians figured out how to make landmines that were uh, non-metallic and therefore uh, didn't register on uh, those uh, uh, landmines. Something... I'm trying to see what volume... Is it not high? I'm not here. The gentleman in the back, can you hear me? You can, okay, fine. Thank you, you know, thank you. So we wanna rapidly detect uh, landmines, unexploded ordnance, those are, are things that you might have on a test range where you're shooting artillery shells or uh, practicing with uh, some explosives and not all of them go off, or uh, ordnance uh, such as uh, cluster bombs and so forth that uh, uh, spread out over the uh, land and not all of them go off. Improvise the explosive devices, which I'll say a little bit about. I will not talk about smuggled nuclear weapons, although that is part of our work, uh, and uh, a lot of that is not uh, in the open. And we wanna do this over large and wide areas with, with large standoff distance between the first responders or the military people and the explosives. We wanna keep the good guys away from the bad stuff, basically as far as we can, so in case there is an explosion that it doesn't hurt, uh, hurt them. So, why are we interested in the subject? It's estimated that there are currently about 110 million landmines in, in the world, and at least uh, 33 countries, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. In the time period between uh, 1999 
and uh, 2016, there were over 100,000 casualties from landmines and about half our children. And that was that first slide I showed you, and that was what motivated us. IEDs and landmines, of course, are, are a source of about half of the U.S. combat deaths in Iraq and Afghanistan. We've lost over 2,500 uh, military people uh, in, in, uh, due to uh, IEDs. So that's another motivating uh, feature. Uh, just to, to drive home that point, uh, the distribution, I'm going to turn around here and use a pointer for a second. If you look at the uh, uh, amount of casualties in that time period, what you find is that about a quarter of them were due to security forces, uh, or at least the security forces uh, are the ones who took the brunt. Only 2% were for the people who were looking for the landmines, and about 75%, three quarters of the casualties are to civilians. And if you break down that civilian number, about half are children and half are adults. And if you look at it at another way, about 86% are for children, um, uh, males, and 14% females. So basically, it's uh, young uh, boys out in the fields playing in, in the minefields, and, and that's, that's a real problem. So that's what motivated us in, in this area. Mines cost between three and $30 to deploy, and the cost of removing them is between $300 and $1,000 each. So that's not a good deal. It's uh, cheaper to put landmines in the ground than it is to, to get them out, and therefore that's why they're uh, used so much. In 2010, we, we the, the world, uh, removed about uh, 100,000 landmines, but two million were planted. So obviously we're losing ground. They're more going into the ground than we're, we're taking out. In addition, uh, the mines create a lot of refugees and internally displaced people. We've seen that in the Mideast and uh, refugees that have gone uh, worldwide, but especially into Europe. I don't know if you can see all this. Uh, I guess you can. Uh, this is uh, from a uh, organization uh, that keeps track of the casualties of landmines, and this happens to be for the year uh, 2016. Now the color code here is the darker the color, uh, the more casualties there were in that particular time period. So you see that there's a lot of casualties in Africa, but even more in the Mideast. And the Balkans used to be an area where we had a lot of problems. Uh, but that's uh, sort of gone away. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, there is one uh, unique feature of this uh, um, particular map, and that's Colombia. Does anybody know why Colombia's got landmines? There weren't any wars there. Anybody? That's right. Uh, the the uh, poppy fields in uh, Colombia are, are mined heavily to, uh, for, from the drug cartels. So that's the only one in, in our hemisphere. So most of these uh, actions take place either in northern Africa, uh, casualties, and there are whole areas from World War II that are un, un, uh, unusable. And it's uh, getting worse. Now we were making, we, again, the world, we're making uh, a, a lot of progress uh, starting in uh, 1999 and reducing the number of casualties, but they're still in the thousands per, per year until about 2013, and then it turned around. And this, this reflects the activity in uh, the Mideast. The latest year we have the data for shows about, uh, about 8,600 uh, casualties in 19, or, uh, 2016. And we don't have data yet on the 17 and 18, but you can bet that they were much larger. We already said there were 100, over 100,000 casualties uh, in that uh, time period. Um, but in uh, last year, 
an estimate was made, there are about a 60 million people, 60 million people at risk from mines and unexploded ordnance in the world. So it's a, it's a large problem, and again, this is a motivating uh, part. So that's how we got into it. Now, how do we detect explosives rapidly rapidly in our project? There are other ways to detect explosives, and a lot of them have to do with vapors and, and uh, uh, even animals who, who, can who can detect some of the explosives. But we have a different way of uh, uh, trying to identify them, and I'll try to explain this very simply to you. I could go into a lot more detail as another lecture, but I'll just give you the mountaintop uh, version. If we look at what makes up an explosive, it has a unique combination of nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Usually it's a very high, or a much higher nitrogen composition, and you can see on the top rows up here, those are explosives, and then you see all kinds of other things. And you, you see that if, if you can detect the nitrogen in the explosive, and you can detect the ratio of nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, you can tell what explosive it is, whether it's TNT, C4, plastic, and so forth. Uh, at least that helps the people get rid of the landmines. So what we're doing is, to, uh, is uh, concentrating on the nitrogen and the hydrogen signature fingerprint uh, by activation analysis with neutrons. Now, I know that's not something you, you get in, in middle school, but I'll try to explain it in a very simple way to you. So how, did we, how do we detect uh, nitrogen-14? when uh, Nitrogen is made up essentially by uh, 14, uh, seven protons and seven neutrons. If we absorb a low energy neutron, we get an excited nitrogen-15. It doesn't like to have that extra neutron in there, and so what it does is it, it, it decays into a stable nitrogen-15 atom and, and a gamma ray, and a gamma ray is a very, very hard X-ray, and uh, that gamma ray has an energy that you just don't see very often, about almost 11 million electron volts. The range of that uh, gamma ray in air is hundreds of feet. Now, that's if it's sitting on the surface. If it's underneath the ground or in the water, then uh, obviously the uh, range of that gamma is much less. So we're concentrating both on uh, explosives that are on the surface, which are more like World War II landmines, but we're also looking at the more current mines that are planted in the Mideast, which are planted much deeper, as well as the mines that are put into the surf and on the beach for landing of Marines uh, when they're uh, landing on some islands or wherever they're, they're, they're landing. So how do we uh, make uh, neutrons, those neutrons that go into the nitrogen, how do we make those? <clears throat> well, let me first of all, now this, this is going to stretch your uh, background in uh, science, but I have to say it because otherwise you won't even understand what I'm, I'm going to say next. If we look at atoms and isotopes. Isotopes have a, a, the same number of uh, uh, protons, but a different number of neutrons. For example, hydrogen has one proton and one electron. Something called deuterium, which is called heavy hydrogen, has one proton and one neutron. Now, that's one out of every 6,000 hydrogen atoms is a deuterium atom. You are all full of deuterium. You all have deuterium in your body. One out of every 6,000 hydrogen atoms, or one out of every 6,000 water molecules has um, a deuterium in it. It's very stable. Uh, it's not radioactive at all. Now, if we add another neutron to that, we get tritium. And tritium is one proton and two neutrons. That's radioactive. And that came out of the uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons program. Uh, the reason I mention those, you'll see in the next couple of slides, we're going to try to fuse 
some of these isotopes. We're going to try to fuse this atom with that atom, or two of these, and so forth. Uh, just below that, you'll see helium. You're all familiar with helium, right? Makes balloons rise, makes your voice sound like Donald Duck. OK, that's helium-4. There is an isotope of helium called helium-3, where one, it's missing one of the neutrons. That changes its nuclear properties drastically. And so we also combine deuterium and helium-3 for making electricity. And that is part of the work that we've been doing for the last uh, several decades. But today, I'm only going to talk about making neutrons. Let's take deuterium and tritium. Remember those two isotopes of hydrogen? One has uh, a neutron and a proton. The other has uh, a proton and two neutrons. If we fuse those together, we, uh, that means push them together at very high temperatures, high, very high velocities, they will actually fuse together and then push out two products. One is a neutron and one is a helium-4 atom. But there's also some loss of mass between the reactants, which are the deuterium and tritium, and the products, which are the neutrons and the helium. And that mass difference is converted into energy by the Einstein equation. You probably all, maybe have all heard of Einstein. He's a very famous scientist who, who did a lot of work on the, in the nuclear area. Well, that mass difference between the products and the reactants gets converted into energy and makes the neutron and the helium atom very energetic. And it's those neutrons uh, that we use to detect the explosives. Now, we can do the same thing with two deuterium atoms as well, but I won't go into the details on that. So, possible cycles. Here's deuterium and tritium, makes a neutron and a helium. It releases a lot of energy. Deuterium, uh, when it reacts, it goes in two different directions. Half the time it goes uh, to a neutron and a helium-3, and the other half the time it makes a hydrogen atom and a tritium atom. Okay? The other two uh, we won't uh, bother with here. So we have in our uh, laboratory four devices that use those fuels to make neutrons. You just see some pictures here and some of the students uh, working on the devices. Um, and some of them are for Homeland Security, some of them are for our drone project, and some of them are looking at uh, thermonuclear fusion to make electricity. Part of the uh, project that we have uh, is fusing deuterium and deuterium. And in a 10 centimeter, that's four inches, but that, that diameter, you see a grid that's highly negatively charged and the positive ions that we make are attracted to the negative grid and they go right through the grid or they hit the wires and make them hot. That's why they're glowing. But you see in the center, fusion. That's, a real, that's an actual picture inside of the fusion device and we're making uh, deuterium, deuterium neutrons. Uh, that's made in a device like this, although this device wasn't made to be small. It's made to be, have a lot of diagnostics. And uh, we've had several students who have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, graduated uh, doing that project. We have another one for Homeland Security of making line sources of neutrons or two-dimensional sources of neutrons like a flat panel TV, but that's a different, different issue. Okay, so, so that's all I'm going to say about we have the devices they work, they make neutrons. Next, I'm going to, now I'm, I'm probably speaking to the younger folks here. <clears throat> Very often it's uh, hard to see <laughs> what the difference is between a million and a billion and a trillion. How many know what a million is? How many know what a billion is? Okay, a little bit less. How, how many know what a trillion is? Well, that's pretty good. Well, and I can go over this very quick. 
a million is the number of Cheerios in a box like this, 125 boxes. There's a million Cheerios, okay? Think about that. 125 of these, that's a million. What's a billion? Oh, but before I leave this, one thing, uh, the, one of the reasons I want to show you this is when we in, our, in the scientific community describe a million, which has six zeros up there, we abbreviate that with a 10 to the small, with a small six. That's 10 to the six, that's a million. That's the same, those are the same numbers. This is the same as that, okay? That's just a shorthand uh, way. What's a billion? Well, it's a number of Cheerios in 125,000 of these boxes. And it's got nine zeros, so that's 10 to the ninth. A billion uh, Cheerios would uh, fill this auditorium. Okay, so now you got some sense of what a billion is, all right? What about a trillion? A trillion, now, that's got 12 zeros, that's 10 with a small 12 up there, and that's a lot of them, and that's the number in 125 million boxes of Cheerios, and that's the number of Cheerios that would fill the Vikings football stadium. That's a trillion, okay? Now that's a Viking stadium, right? I don't think they're much different than the other, other stadiums, but uh, that, that's a good number. Now, what I was really trying to get at, though, is I'm going to show you some numbers that have this unit. And that only means it's the number of zeros that we're using, okay? So whether it's a million, a billion, or a trillion, it, you can tell by that little uh, 12 there that's got 12 zeros behind it. All right, now this one, uh, I'm, uh, I apologize a little bit to start out with because this is real data, but I, I have a point I wanna make out of this. If I look to the number of neutrons that the, we've actually produced in the laboratory, you'll see <coughs> on the left-hand side, the uh, number of neutrons per second are two, three, uh, or at least uh, uh, units of 10 to the eighth. 10 to the eighth is eight zeros. So that's 100 million at 10 to the eighth. And you can see that we're, we've made up to about 300 million neutrons per second in the laboratory through uh, a DD uh, cycle. If I substitute that one of those deuterium atoms with a tritium atom, then I have 100 times more neutrons, or we're talking uh, a, a quite a bit more, about 10 billion. So uh, what do we need? We need about 10 to the eighth neutrons per second. 10 to the eighth is 100 million, right? And here's how we use them. Now, the idea is to detect an explosive, an IED, which is that little thing under the ground. But you may be in a city where you don't have line of sight or you don't want line of sight to be close to the, to the explosive. So we use a um, uh, vehicle with a gasoline engine to make electricity, just like you make when the, the grid is down and your electricity goes off and you turn on your own generator at home. <laughs> These generators uh, will make uh, tens of uh, kilowatts of electricity, and they make radio frequency waves. Now, what do we mean by radio frequency waves? How many of you have used your microwave oven today? Okay, so you know, you know a lot about microwave ovens, right? RF waves heat your coffee, your orange drink, or whatever you put in there, hopefully nothing living. And uh, this is a, a um, frequency at two and a half, what we call two and a half gigahertz, which we won't get into the, what that means, but it's, that's the frequency that you use. And by making those waves, they can be beamed up uh, hundreds of meters 
into the sky to a drone uh, that uses something called a rectenna, which is the opposite of an antenna. Antennas are used for radio. You generate a signal, antennas. Rectenna takes the waves and converts it back to electricity. And uh, this has already been demonstrated by a company called Raytheon. Some of you may have already uh, heard of them. And they can generate uh, electricity with about 85% efficiency, de uh, direct current to direct current. All right, so now we got it up to the, the relay drone, if we don't have line of sight. The relay drone just goes the opposite. You're making electricity up there. You convert it back to radio frequency waves, which you beam down to a neutron generator, which converts now that RF energy to electricity to run the neutron generator. And the neutron drone is surrounded by three battery-powered gamma detector drones. <clears throat> and after we uh, irradiate uh, the uh, nuclear or the, uh, the explosive with neutrons, we'll find that the 10.8 MeV gammas actually uh, can be detected by the detectors, knowing where they're at. And when they detect it, they can find out where that bomb was. I apologize. I uh, picked up a little bug here. <clears throat> so uh, we, with this particular project, can locate the explosives to about a 10 centimeter location. 10 centimeters is about that. So now the drones are only about two meters, six feet above the ground. So using drones at six feet above the ground, we can find the explosives to within 10 centimeters using the neutron flux that we uh, just we, we talked about. This is an example of how that works. Uh, the, you'll see the drone up here. As it moves across the top of the screen, that color red is what we want. Uh, those are what we call thermalized. The downscattered neutrons, and they're the ones that activate the nitrogen. And you can see how that works. Okay. So how does this work on uh, in a cartoon? Just to to give you some some example. You can see that we're, we're trying to find that explosive uh, that's under that red uh, bullseye there. And we're not line of sight, that is, we're behind a building. And you can see the uh, radio wave, the RF, uh, radio frequency waves being generated by just a fossil fuel source. In this case, we use a Humvee, but you could use anything else uh, with a quadcopter uh, or a, uh, uh, different kinds of... Uh, drones, uh, uh, convert that back to electricity, power the drone that carries the neutron source, and the gamma rays then are detected by the uh, 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 squadron of uh, gamma detectors, uh, the three that we have orbiting uh, the, that drone. There's a, uh, I, I mentioned this before, that uh, the, uh, Bad guys uh, tend to put mines on the beaches when the Marines would land, and we, we need to find those before the Marines uh, land. And, and of course, you could use a different uh, mode of uh, generating the electricity and the RF waves uh, to, to power the drones, again, with or without a line of sight. The one of the things that we're now concerned about, and, and the Navy is very concerned about, is finding mines in the water. And that's a different uh, project here that we're, we have working, because neutrons react differently in water than they do in sand. So that, that's another, another thing. All right, now, th this is something that I, I put in just for the young folks here, so all you parents can can uh, go to sleep for a minute. 
Um, how does a metric ton compare to an English ton? Do you, how many people know about the metric system? Wow, that's great, terrific. Because you know the United States is uh, perhaps the only country now in the world that uses the uh, English system. And so when we talk about tons, we usually talk about English tons, but the rest of the world talks about uh, uh, metric tons. Well, one English ton is about two th is 2,000 pounds. And that's about six Minnesota linemen, right? They're all about 300 and some pounds. I think they're all like that now. So that's the difference. But what's the difference between those and, and a metric ton, which is 2,200 pounds? You got to throw in a quarterback. So, so that's the difference between English and metric system in terms of tons. Now, one ton in the metric system is 1,000 kilograms. So what's a kilogram? Well, a kilogram, 10 kilograms, weighs 22 pounds, or the weight of two and a half gallons of milk. And that's the payload that we have on those uh, drones, is about a 10 kilogram neutron source, which weighs about 22 pounds, and so the drone has to carry that much weight. Now you think about two and a half gallons of milk, that's substantial, right? Uh, that's already standard technology in the movie industry. They carry 28, 29 pounds cameras. So that's already uh, demonstrated. Now, we're, what are our uh, uh, design parameters? Well, first of all, uh, we're trying to uh, put this together with a 10 kilogram or less mass, which means 22 pounds or less, to consume less than 10 kilowatts. One kilowatt is uh, equal to a hairdryer. You all probably have used a hairdryer at some time. Well, one hairdryer consumes about one kilowatt, takes one kilowatt. Uh, so 10 would be like 10 hair dryers. So that's a substantial amount of uh, 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 power that you need, and that's more than batteries can provide on drones. That's why we need the RF to power the drone. The distance from the controller base to the drone, now I'm gonna quote this in, in meters, but one meter is 1.1 yard. That's around 200 uh, meters. That's two football fields, uh, or non-line of sight, maybe 100 meters. That's a football field. So that keeps the good guys away from the bad stuff. The energy of the neutrons, if we make them with the deuterium, deuterium isotopes we talked about, is two and a half MeV, million electron volts. And uh, if we make it with tritium, uh, the same uh, parameters, it was 14 MeV uh, of uh, 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 energy. Now, wh what does that mean? What does 14 MeV mean? Well, the velocity of a 14 MeV neutron is about 100 million miles per hour. Now think about that, 100 million miles per hour. What that means is that when you emit the neutrons, they are emitted, they travel down to the surface, they bounce around in the surface, they find the nitrogen and release the, the gamma ray all in microseconds. So basically the drone is standing still because in a microsecond it doesn't move very much. So th that's, that's another part of the, the design. Uh, the dr uh, drone speed is about two meters per second. Uh, that's about uh, four four and a half miles per hour, so it's not very fast, but two meters a second, you know, it's moving along. You can't run that fast very well. And um, the drones are flying anywhere from three feet to six feet above the ground. Now, why above, why so close to the ground? Well, the closer you get to the ground, the more neutrons you have to activate the explosives. The uh, uh, six, six or seven feet 
is high enough that it should go over most obstacles on the ground. And the interesting part of this is you can put that into a field, into a road, on a bridge, or any place where you, some places where you can't even take a, a vehicle. And then the detection distance uh, under the ground uh, with the DD neutrons is about two and a half feet. And with the DT neutrons, it's about three feet. So about that high. That's how far down we can de detect the explosives. <clears throat> Where can this be used? Well, you can uh, identify chemical explosives in backpacks after you separate them from the humans. You can you could find them on, when they're on the humans, but you don't want to radiate the human at the same time. Detection of uh, truck bombs speeding towards a venue. A venue could be a embassy, uh, could be a gathering of uh, uh, students uh, at a concert. Rapid scanning of grounds around uh, uh, NFL stadiums before the crowd arrives. Interrogate a drone, uh, another drone, uh, that might have explosives on it headed for a parade. Think of the Boston Marathon. Uh, you can interrogate a flock of drones headed for a venue, in this case, a fleet of ships. Find out which ones are carrying the explosives. Scanning parking lots uh, for uh, um, explosives in cars after the, particip uh, the participants have uh, entered the, wherever they're going. And all of the, all the above related to nuclear uh, weapons. So find a nuclear bomb the same way, well, with different physics, of course. And it may be possible to detect chemical weapons related to these scenarios that I just quoted. Sarin, mustard gas, uh, anything that contains fluorine, phosphorus, or chlorine puts out a unique fingerprint of gamma rays when you irradiate it with neutrons. Okay, so let's, let's just take a look at a couple examples. Here's a real case of somebody who who looks like he's got bombs here. You got the police uh, uh, looking at him. If you sent a drone in, you could actually uh, detect whether those uh, backpacks carry explosives or not. If they don't carry explosives, then you have one set of actions. If they carry explosives, you obviously do something different. So what if we uh, take the case of uh, interrogating uh, suspicious vehicles, if there's ever a vehicle looks suspicious, that one did, and it's going towards an embassy. And you think, well, what's, what's in that vehicle? Does it have explosives in it or not? Well, if you uh, had a drone, that, uh, and these drones could essentially keep up with it, they could uh, hover over the uh, vehicle as it's speeding down the road to find out uh, if it has explosives. If it's got a ton of explosives, the neutrons pass right through the roof. They don't even care about uh, the, the car, they can see what's inside of it. So that's another way to detect threats uh, going towards an embassy or towards a gathering of people. This one, you know, uh, in the last lecture I gave, somebody had good eyes and could tell what stadium this was, but I'm going to ask at, at the end of this. <clears throat> if we wanted to, before uh, the game starts, <clears throat> we could have a drone that interrogates all of the uh, uh, dumpsters, uh, trash cans, everything else around a stadium, see if it has any explosives before the game starts or inside the stadium. So, anybody know what stadium this is? Wow, okay, young man. Lambeau Field, my goodness, you're really on the ball here. Okay, great. Okay. Now, what happens if we have a whole flock of drones? And the Navy is very worried about this for uh, uh, ships and, and uh, uh, protecting fleets. Well, if you set out, uh, we sent up our drone, sent out a beam of neutrons, we could find out which one of the drones has explosives in it and say, shoot that one down first. Now, if they all had explosives, then we got a real problem. But very often, uh, the bad guys uh, will not do it that way. They'll send out uh, a, a whole bunch and only have a few that are, are armed. And here's an example of looking at uh, parking lots. Um, 
after the uh, people have left to go into the stadium to see if there's any explosives. So just to finish, and this is a lesson for all you young folks. Don't listen to everybody that tells you it can't be done. And you say, well, okay, what does that mean? A guy named Wilbur Wright, who uh, some of you may know, said that uh, man will not fly for 50 years. And that was 1901. Only a couple years later, he and his brother flew. Said it couldn't be done. And a couple years, they had it done. There is a uh, Lord Kelvin, who was the president of the, of the Royal Society, said heavier than air, air machines are impossible. Well, that was 1895. I don't know, you've all probably flown on airplanes. You know that they're not impossible. There was a, a general, a French general, during, uh, who was a, a general in uh, World War II, said airplanes are interesting toys but of no military value. Now that's a general. So that didn't uh, work out very well, did it? There's a guy named Einstein who said in 1932 that there is not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be obtainable. It would mean that the atom would have to be shattered at will. He said that in 1932. Ten years later, we were working on the atom bomb. And a few years later, we had actually exploded one. And that was Einstein, who everybody has a lot of respect for. A guy named Ernest Rutherford said, anyone who looks for a source of power in the transformation of the nucleus is talking moonshine. In other words, it'll never work. We have 104 nuclear power plants in the United States now producing electricity. These are all very famous people who are in high, high, high level positions. And finally, uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Woolley, who is the Astronomer Royal in uh, Space Advisor to the British government, said in 1956, space travel is utter bilge. Well, uh, 13 years later, we were on the moon. So the, the whole point of these are that very famous people and people in high positions very often we'll tell you, you can't do that. And all these things happen. So don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. Now, there are some things you can't do, but don't be deterred by the first person who says you can't do it. So thank you very much, and we'll have questions. OK, young scientists, those who have got questions, raise your hand. One right here. In all the scenarios you said about the drones scanning before like a venue or something, you said all the humans would be gone. So if there was a human in a car, would that interfere with the drone? I'm, I, I'm sorry, I just hear this. This is making too much noise. I'll get over this here. In all the scenarios you said about the drone scanning like a parking lot or yeah. a stadium, you said if all the participants were yeah. gone. OK, yeah. You want to know what would happen if the participants were there? Yeah. OK, so let me let me go back to one of the slides here. Um, uh, I'll get there. If you were laying on this bomb right here, right on top of it, and the drone passed over you at two meters a second at the neutron uh, numbers that we were just talking about, you would get exposed to neutrons and you would get some radiation. That radiation is equivalent for you getting on an airplane in Washington, D.C. and flying to London, simply because the airplane is up uh, above a significant part of the atmosphere. You never think about that when you travel to Europe or Japan or something, but every time you get on an airplane, you get a fair amount of uh, mm -hmm. radiation. That's the amount of radiation you would get if you were on, laying on top of the bomb. Now, a lot of people are, are very much afraid of that, and that's, um, that's understandable. But uh, it's nothing compared, if you were laying on a bomb, what that would do. So, is, is, that, is that sort of answer your question? OK, good question.
How directional is your neutron source? Like what, how directional is it? Oh, that's a good uh, point too. That I, I didn't uh, say that, but you're, you're, uh, you've identified a very important part. Neutrons are emitted isotropically. Okay. Now you could collimate them by using reflectors and have a, a semi beam, not entirely, uh, uh, reduce all the neutrons. But we don't care about the neutrons that go up. And in fact, when you're down that close to the ground, uh, you really have a uh, what we call half uh, half a steridium, uh, uh, where the majority of the neutrons are. They're not pencil beams. They do get emitted isotropically, meaning they get emitted all directions. Uh, but the ones that go up, we don't care about. Could be, you said that the detectors detect for a nitrogen and oxygen and stuff like that uh, and carbon. Those are all like really common in life and organic stuff. Mm -hmm. So how do you avoid like thinking that that dog over there is a bomb? If I understood your, your question, oxygen, hydrogen, All our life-related uh, material. The way you, you do this is because of the high nitrogen content. We, we don't have a lot of nitrogen, in it. Uh, or in some places like uh, uh, in uh, the desert, for example, there's very little nitrogen. So if you go like to uh, Iraq, or you go to northern Africa, Libya. If you see a lot of nitrogen in one spot, uh, chances are that's an explosive. Now what you can do is you can go back and over that area, hover over it, and if you hover over it long enough, you can subtract the background out, and then you'll find out whether it is an explosive or not. So uh, there are ways to distinguish uh, from these uh, nitrogen in the air, for example, which is very diffuse, versus an explosive. And if you have a ton of explosives, it's duck soup. I mean, you, you can, you'll, you'll tell that in, in a minute. Now, fertilizer is the only thing that you worry about. Uh, fertilizer has a lot of nitrogen in it. And, but if you see a lot of fertilizer in the desert, you know that they're trying to hide something. Okay. But a good question. If landmines and bombs explode metal and other metal, well, like, solid objects, how come it doesn't always kill humans? Okay, uh, Vinod, I, I couldn't, can you, can you uh, translate that one? Since landmines and bombs can explode metal and other solid objects, mm -hmm. um, how how come it doesn't always kill people? It only gives sometimes them disabilities. But when, it, when a bomb explodes, if you're right next to it, the concussion, the shock wave, will will basically kill you. Uh, it'll. Um, You'll implode uh, lungs and eardrums and all and so forth. Shrapnel, <coughs> which is what uh, uh, the metal would be, could hit you in the arm or the leg or something, which would cause damage, but it won't kill you. Uh, but if it hits your heart, you're dead. So it's a little hard to answer your question. Uh, you, a lot of people die from explosives if they're close. If they're far away and they get hit by a few pieces of metal, it may cause damage, but may, maybe not death. Now, if the mine doesn't have any metal on it, it's a, it's a non-metallic mine. Uh, sometimes they put ceramic ceramic balls in the in the mine. And the ceramic can, can do a lot of damage, but it doesn't show up on a magnetometer or you know something that detects magnetic field. So that's a little harder. But with the neutrons, you can always find that. What would okay. you do after you locate a bomb? What would you do after you locate a bomb? After it's located, what do you do? 
do oh, with how, that? How do you get rid of it? That's a good question. We are only identifying the bombs. There is a whole different technology of getting rid of the bombs once you know where they're at. Um, and I, again, that's not my field, but there are, once you know where the, where the explosive is, then you can either get rid of it by putting a, another explosive on top of it and blowing up that, and that will set off the explosive below it, or you hit it with something uh, that would, would uh, cause it to, to explode. Or you try to dig it up, but that you know digging it up is a little dangerous. Uh, so, but that's not that's not something that we're doing. We're only identifying where the explosives are, and that's half the battle. Good. Next question. Uh, since it's radiation, could lead stop that? Like maybe if it was like a car like that, would lead paint stop the? Uh, since the neutrons coming out of the drone are radiation, could lead coming from it stop it? Like the radiation from getting through? Yeah, uh, like, because lead blocks ra like radioactive things, yeah, then... And could, like, other things that make, make radiation interfere with the devices? So, like, could those, the three gamma ray detectors get messed up if there was, like, I don't know, something that was causing radiation? Would they detect something else? What if you're in a densely populated area and you have to remove the bomb, what would happen? What would happen if you're in a densely populated area and you have to like remove the bomb? What would happen? Okay, it is, it is 8 o'clock, so just a couple of things here. One month from now, on March 4th, we do have a presentation <coughs> <coughs> where the medical technologist is going to be explaining about the walls, heart walls, mechanical heart walls. That's the technology he's working on, and that's the information he'll be sharing. That's on March 4th. Uh, please confirm on the website about this particular presentation because it is not finalized, that's the, reason, that's the reason it has not been announced, but that's what is in the plans. Um, let's thank Dr. Kulsinski for his time here. He has come here from Madison just for the Young Scientist Roundtable. And I, I should say that uh, I realize that I was talking over your heads and, and many times. 
But that's, there's a good point to that. That, is, that tells you what you don't know. Now when you go back to school, you can ask questions. Ask your teachers about some of the things that you didn't ask here and see if they can give you the answers. Don't take anybody's uh, uh, word for some of these things except your teachers. So. Okay, good, thank you. Sorry the sound system was not good today, but hopefully we'll be fixing it next.